Hi, everyone. This is podcast manager Patrick speaking. The reason you're hearing my voice is because Alan recorded this current episode in the coffee fields of Columbia. While he was vacationing there, he realized, sadly, there wasn't really a good place to record a professional, high-quality sounding podcast. So instead, he decided to run a little bit of an experiment and just walk with the mics and Simon through one of the fields within the coffee triangle. I honestly think it was a pretty cool idea. I think the episode came out great. There are a little bit of audio inconsistencies, so we apologize for that, and we will be reverting back to the original style come Monday's episode. But if you can get past the random noises, there is a tremendous amount of value in this episode, and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for being a listener. The extraordinary belongs to those that create it. Rebelling against business plans and debt, rebelling against what society expects of us to build cool businesses, make money, have fun and do good. Let's create something extraordinary together. Welcome to The Rebel Entrepreneur. So welcome to The Rebel Entrepreneur podcast and this is a mini experiment podcast inspired by my wife Katie. Uh, We were at a Colombian thinker and the noise meant that it was impossible to record a podcast. They had a sauna, we thought about recording it in the sauna, but it was the most echoey space I think we have. Uh, The son of the guy on the thinker was riding his dirt bike round in circles and there was just no way we could have recorded it, was there Simon? Uh, No, and also the the trucks that were going past uh, about 20 miles an hour in first gear outside the front of the (laughs) Finca meant that it just wasn't going to happen. So, my wife suggested, why don't you hike into the coffee Finca and record it in the countryside of Colombia? So this is the first ever walking podcast we have done on The Rebel Entrepreneur, and Simon and I are in the Eje Cafetero, the coffee triangle of Colombia, walking through the mountains of Colombia in a coffee field. How do you feel about that, Simon? I think it's uh, a few records will be broken today. (laughs) This is the breathiest (laughs) podcast episode we've recorded because um, for all of the the listeners to the podcast, you should know that Alan walks at about 415 miles an hour. He has slowed down now. (laughs) And it's also the sweatiest. a lot of energy. (laughs) Uh, So, welcome to the Rebel Entrepreneur Podcast. So, the idea behind this episode, it's a very special one in the coaching series, and the idea is, it's to talk about what we've learnt coaching people to start businesses, and it'll be a break in the Christina season. So, the first 10 episodes with Christina have been a lot about the digital life of her business, And actually, in the next episode you'll hear with Christina, there'll be a step change in where we're going with her business. I run an exercise with her that helps her come to a realisation of what she truly needs to learn to build her business. Um, So during that break, I really wanted to do an episode about what we've learnt coaching business. So we've got two episodes planned that Simon and I are going to do together. This one, Simon is going to more lead the episode asking me questions about what we've learnt coaching Christina, Jamie, Andrew, Keith and the people on the coaching series. Uh, And then I'm going to do the next episode talking to Simon about what he's learnt coaching people at the Rebel Business School events, which have been quite virtual recently. Um, And the reason for doing this is we think the insights that will come from this podcast will help you to self-coach you on your business. That's the plan. That sounds like a good plan, huh? (laughs) Can you just give me a second whilst I deal with this mosquito that's just landed on my knee? Simon has been eaten alive in Colombia. I don't know, he's probably the tastiest man on the tour because he's been bitten to death whilst we've been in Colombia. I've survived okay, but you can probably hear us crunching through the leaves as we walk through the coffee plantation. We'll post some pictures of this as well uh, on the Rebel Business School bit. I guess before we get into the questions, like why are we in Colombia, Simon? Do you know what, as I woke up this morning, Alan, I asked myself the same <laughs> question. <laughs> We're basically in Colombia 
the long story short is we had these amazing Colombian guys came on our UK course, realised the impact of what we teach and how we teach it and decided that this needs to go back to Colombia to help uh, people across the country start businesses debt free, get their ideas up and running and help the country recover from a you know, really, really tricky period in its history. And then, you know, over the last 18 months, two years, we've been building relationships. And when the guys launched the very first uh, course in Bogota in November 2020, which, the height of the pandemic, yeah, like, I, uh, I don't know how they did that, but, but phenomenal. And since then, they've partnered with WWF to run a series of courses in different parts of Colombia. And that has led us to coming out to Colombia and, and uh, working on the business with them. But something very special is about to happen, Alan. I don't even know if we're allowed to talk about this yet, are we? Oh, of but course we screw are. it, let's do it anyway. <laughs> Marketing are going to hang us for what we're about to share. So we actually had, I don't know who had the idea, we had the idea years ago about launching our own coffee brand because our first ever meetings launching the Rebel Business School. Uh, and please be aware, you will get background noise from the plantation. I have no idea what animal that is making that noise near us. That's quite loud, isn't it, Simon? It is loud. I was just like, I just hesitated for a second because it sounded like we tripped some sort of alarm. <laughs> <laughs> but it is actually uh, some birds or of some description. Or some kind of bug. If you know, please message us and try and keep us safe, preferably via typo text. Um, so actually, like, we always dreamed of launching our own coffee brand, uh, but it was just a dream. We were too busy running Rebel Business School. Um, and then eventually we started to think this might actually happen. Fabi, one of the, the team that is building Rebel Business School Columbia, had a friend who roasts coffee in London and imports it from uh, Columbia. And we're actually walking through his family's farm where the coffee is produced. And our plan is to see where the coffee's produced, to learn about the coffee, and then to launch our own brand of coffee where the profits, 100% of the profits, will be used to support our mission of teaching entrepreneurship around the world. That's the plan. So we'll do that today. What should we do tomorrow, Alan? <laughs> so anyway, Simon, we need to get on with the episode. Let's get straight into this. Uh, you said you'd written some questions for me, and as you probably all are aware on the podcast, I like nothing more than Simon's questions. He asks deep, insightful questions that make one think. So we're going to get into this, Alan, and I've got, as you know, a bunch of uh, ideas and questions that will, um, one way or another, drag out some answers from you. <laughs> <laughs> you know I love a good question. Um, so like, let's helicopter above the coaching episodes that you've done. For those that haven't caught up on those episodes yet, just, just tell us who are the people that you've coached and give us a quick rundown of the kinds of businesses that they've been working on. So the very first coaching series actually happened organically. It was with uh, a lady called Christina. I did a random Zoom call for anyone listening to the podcast as a test for myself to see if anyone listened. <laughs> I said, anyone can join me on this date and time. And 15, 20 people turned up and Christina was one. And she said, uh, my question for you is, how do I market my business? And I'm like, uh, can't answer that in five minutes on a <laughs> group Zoom. Let's do an episode together. And the episode turned into two and three and etc. And that's how the coaching series was born. And yeah, so Christina had a photography business. Uh, she does uh, food, beverage, pictures in Los Angeles. Um, and that led to the second season, um, which the second season was a lady called Jamie, who was the artist uh, who ended up deciding that she was going to sell a comic book on Kickstarter. She filled out the feedback form for season one. That's how we got in touch and made friends. Season three was Andrew, the YouTuber who did calisthenics. Uh, and he just hounded me until I said yes to coaching him on the podcast, which I love. Season four was Keith. Uh, who launched a food truck business in Nevada and he's been on a few of the podcasts. He's a really interesting chap. And then 
season five has been back to Christina, which we actually never took a break from coaching. Uh, I coached her immediately. She quit her job to continue going. And um, yeah, so those are the five. So we've had a YouTuber, a photographer, an artist, and uh, a food truck business. Uh, and then I've got plenty of more seasons, which I've already recorded. Very exciting. So what were the commonalities between you know, when you think about the learnings that seem to map across all four of the episodes, was there a pattern? Was there anything that was the same for all, for all of those guys or was it, you know, different for each one? Uh, with the exception of Keith, I would say the commonality was the nervousness of doing the marketing and making the sales calls. So Christina was nervous selling the photography business, making sales calls, contacting people. Jamie, we had lengthy discussions. She was doing it online, but I was trying to persuade her to direct message people to sell the comic book. And she didn't like doing it. She felt nervous. She felt awkward. Andrew was trying to contact sponsors for his YouTube channel and he felt awkward and nervous and he was trying to find ways to not call people. <laughs> That's a definite theme, Simon, of everything we do, is people try and avoid the work they actually need to do by coming up with, in quotation marks, clever ways of doing it. What do you make of that? Oh, like, I totally understand this is exactly what I did. It's like, I don't go like cold calling. I want to avoid it at all costs. I'll do anything else. And my original avoidance tactics were uh, work on the website. <laughs> you know, like, I laugh at myself now because I did exactly what everyone else does. Work on the website, you know, create a brochure that I can mail to people because then I don't have to ring them anything but doing that. So I would have said the four of them, the three of them, that's exactly the same thing. They had exactly the same problem I did. And I think it's actually, you've faced this as well, haven't you? Avoiding doing what you actually need to do. Yeah, to we were on. saying it the other day, weren't we? That the lesson from the Stoics, that the obstacle is the way, that book yes. by Ryan Holiday that uh, summarized all of the, um, the, the teachings of Seneca and Marcus Aurelius and so on. The obstacle is the way. And I, I find myself saying on every single course, the thing that you are putting off, the thing that you're finding the hardest is usually the signpost to what you need to do next. <laughs> Isn't, Isn't that, that frustrating? <laughs> Can you believe Come that? on, universe. Come on, universe. The thing that I don't want to do is the thing I have to tackle. So I guess the question to the audience at this point, to everyone listening this, is what are you putting off? What are you avoiding doing? What's the thing that you know you should do deep inside, but you just don't want to? What is that thing? And then how do we find the energy to make it happen? So what was your tactic to get the guys through that hurdle? Did you, did you um, go with it and let them get on with it and sort of figure their own way through? Um, I mean, having known you for... 14, it's 15 not really years. My style, <laughs> is it? Just the, as I'm saying that out loud, I'm going, oh, you put them under loads of pressure and we made it happen. Okay. So, what, what was your strategy? What was behind your thinking and what was the impact? Well, like, is you have to let people make their own mistakes to a certain extent. I had to make my own mistakes to learn where I was going. It does help if someone has said to you, this is a mistake, but go try it and you've got the freedom to express and then you can kind of let the person go off and they'll do a mini experiment and come back and go oh you're right <laughs> this worked better than this so i think there has to be a certain element of that there is also from experience nothing beats a phone call nothing beats someone actually directly messaging directly taking action sending a video making a phone call nothing beats that and that has been proven out in 10 years of teaching entrepreneurship plus another seven or eight years of doing our own business where <laughs> like we know we have to do it and my approach is a combination of telling stories about my failures Simon nearly slipped that in was a, close. In you have to go silent for a second. It's the third time today. Like I almost, I went, I went up so high in the air, I came down with snow on me. Which in the Colombian jungle, that's quite a feat. That's how high I went. Possibly the most dangerous podcast episode we've done yet. 
uh, just in terms of the environment, nothing else. Um, so, yeah, my approach was tell stories about what I've learnt, help them to decide on the top three things they want to experiment with, and then probably force one of those top three things to be the thing that I think will work, but allow them to fill the other space. Love that. So that they can do a test of those three marketing ideas, approaches, whatever it is, business ideas, doesn't really matter. Um, so if I was to summarise that, you're basically saying, uh, I will let you play out what you think you need to do next, but I'm not going to let you off the hook of the thing that I know to be true. Yes. And then I will make oh, you no. commit to what you're going to do on the podcast to thousands of people. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and these people, wait, these people volunteered for this? <laughs> sounds really bad when you say it like that, but no, I, I genuinely it. believe it helps. I genuinely believe it helps. Can I dive into the, the fear thing for a second? Because I think what you've just described for those three guys, before we move on to Keith as well, what we, you've just described I think is so true of the vast majority of people that come through our courses that are feeling stuck with their business mm -hmm. ideas. There are always other factors, but that is often one of the biggest hurdles that people have to get over, don't they? Like, how real is that fear of not wanting to make a phone call or not wanting to send a direct message or a text or post something in a WhatsApp group? You know, is it is it baseless? Do people just need to get on with it because it's not gonna hurt them? Or is there any element of, you know, actually you do need to be a little bit careful about this because, like, what's your view on that? So the fear is 100% real. The fear is real. The negative downside, the impact, less so. And for most of the people we talk to, they're so conscientious, kind, they consider everyone else before themselves. Like, you need to push so much further beyond where you think the boundary of annoying is to even start to be annoying. Like, if there was a scale of annoying salespeople, most of the people we coach are so far from even being on the start of the scale of annoying that... I'm like, you just need to push 50 times further to get there. To even get to be in the running of yes. annoying. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're so afraid of, like, causing offence, creating a problem. And the fear is real. The outcome is very rare. Like, it is very rare to get to a point where someone will tell you to off, like, stop calling me, stop doing this. Like, that is very rare. There are, I don't know, one in a hundred people who come on the course that need the opposite advice <laughs> of tone down your directness and make friends first. Mm. Uh, but most people are so far the other way that they spend all their time making friends and never directly ask for the sale. And you just get lost in that. You can spend years making friends, have such a strong group <laughs> of friends, but never get a sale. Yeah, and I think the, the thing I would add to that, I think that I've noticed is the fear, the fear of the reaction is what you've been talking about, um, but there's also the fear of the discomfort of doing it. Oh, I the think, awkwardness. Yeah, the, I think people are kind of scared of, I don't want to put myself through that discomfort because it doesn't feel very nice, does it? <laughs> and I think, you know, the, the flip side of that is, I mean, you're of the king of discomfort Alan if there's ever someone I've ever met in my life who's happy and I don't say happy but you know comfortable with uncomfortable it's you I, I guess like we're going to be all right aren't we we can handle it well, we're going to be What's awkward the worst? and yeah. it's so I have an expression for this which I repeat to myself which has helped me which is your success in life is directly proportionate to the number of uncomfortable moments you can sit through and what do most people spend their life doing? Yeah, we hunt for, the un hunt for the comfortable, don't we? They hunt for the comfortable, they avoid the uncomfortable. And if your success in life is tied to going through uncomfortable moments, you're basically avoiding the stuff that will make you successful, which comes back to the obstacle is the way, the thing that is the uncomfortable thing, the thing that is this. And what happened yesterday, Simon, with our meeting at breakfast? We were talking about that on the hike up here to the coffee plantation of an awkward breakfast and yeah. how we both responded to it. All I wanted was some eggs. 
<laughs> All I wanted was a business model so that we can make this coffee thing happen. I wanted Come some on. eggs, and then I wanted a business model. <laughs> so look, uh, you said that there was um, <clears throat> there was a commonality between three out of the four coaching series that you've recorded and released so far. What was different about Keith? Uh, fascinatingly, Keith, and I absolutely love him, he was the opposite from having to push him to do things. He was like, OK, I feel like you're going too far out there, Keith. I need to hold you back. <laughs> um, and I had an experience last year in Oaxaca uh, with my wife, Katie. And she will, like, if she gets a training programme, if she fo- she will follow it to the nth degree. She does not need external motivation. Yeah. And the coach that she had at that point was pushing her to do more, but she didn't need it. Yeah. It was to the detriment of her health. And actually what I've realized in coaching is you have to understand who it is you're coaching and where they are on the scale of impulsive action versus reflection as to how much you have to push. With Keith, I didn't have to push. (laughs) I definitely didn't have to push, it just happened. All I had to do was ask. And actually, I spent a lot of my time questioning his decisions to help him try and think it through. And we're planning a catch-up episode. I was messaging him this week. Uh, He's actually uh, closed down the food truck business. And we're going to have a catch-up episode to work out what happened with the food truck mini experiment. What did you think? How did it fit into your life? And Can't wait for that. This is a man who's got a full-time job, is in the Army Reserves, has eight kids. And he's not got a significant <laughs> amount of spare time. No, wow. So it's quite interesting. Keith was very the opposite end. And I think for everyone listening to this, what I would like to say is know yourself first. How much of a just take action person are you? And do you need to give yourself a few days to reflect and talk to people before you take action? Versus how much are you on the Simon end of the scale where you'll think for 14 weeks before taking action? Slight jab, Simon. Do you want to make it back from this farm walk in one piece? (laughs) I'm more afraid of the mosquitoes than you. Hair in the tortoise, Alan. Hair in the tortoise. (laughs) So listen... What are you most proud of, before I knock you out, what are you most proud of from the, um, from the coaching episodes that you've done? Because you've really helped some people, not, not just the actual individuals that have blessed them for volunteering to put themselves know, through a series of calls with you. But, but you know, you've helped others that have listened to that. And, and I tell you, one of the brilliant things about Rebel School is that we can signpost artists to the episode about Jamie. Yes. We can signpost food, food businesses to the episodes with Keith. So that's really cool. But what are you most proud of from those? I think there's been two or three episodes where we've finally broken through to the fear and how to overcome it. And I think some of the episodes are more surface talking about business tactics and what do you do and some of the episodes get into like there was a particular episode with Jamie about dealing with imposter syndrome where like we had to go deep to be able to deal with that imposter syndrome and had a similar moment with Christina about sales calls and people don't always tell me what's going on they know they should do it and then they just go away and beat themselves up for not doing it rather than opening up to me and going Alan I know I should be making sales calls but the last time I sat in my room for an hour and couldn't do it crying it's like tell me that and then we can deal with the real thing Mm. rather than me feeling like I'm pushing you and feeling resistance They've been incredible because they've been open about it. But those are the episodes that I'm really proud of because I think everyone out there can relate to those. And I can tell my stories of going to a mentor and being told to make sales calls, making 100 sales calls in the morning, getting his feedback and then just being ripped to pieces and crying on the wall outside for an hour. But it doesn't have the same impact as coaching someone through it doesn't have the same impact those that's what I'm proud of is those episodes that really find what I think we all struggle with 
Love that. So I've got some questions about your learnings uh, in two two halves. Like the first half, I'm su- super interested in what you've learned about business from coaching. Because I don't know about you, but every time I stand up and deliver, well, on Zoom, sit down and deliver uh, <laughs> our courses and our content, even though I'm so familiar with the content, I find myself learning new things yes. when someone asks me a question that's specific to their business or even just just saying out loud. It's a privilege, isn't it? Saying out loud the stuff that we've learned. You actually have new insights whilst doing it. I yes. wondered if there's anything that you'd learned about business from doing those coaching sessions. One of the things Simon says is that the quality of the question is directly proportionate to the length of pause (laughs) from the person answering it. You're welcome. I know, thank you. Uh, It's a quality question. What did I learn about business? I struggle with that question because business is business and this is going to sound quite arrogant but like you're selling sponsorship on a thing you're selling photography you're selling comic books there's nuances to them all but sales is sales marketing is marketing like let's just get on with it and sell the thing and Sometimes I actually get frustrated with people telling me that their situation is unique. I get super frustrated and I kind of want to shout at people, you're not a special snowflake, or actually maybe you are just like everyone else. And we just need to get on and sell and produce the business and do the thing. Um, And that sounds really bad, doesn't it, Simon? But... Well, I think one of your superpowers, Alan, we, we had a conversation about superpowers uh, this morning, last night, um, it is simplifying and getting to the the action that will have the biggest impact. Because there's lots of stuff that you can be, uh, you can have your time hoovered up by, isn't it? You know, when oh, you're talking yeah. about business, you know. There's lots of stuff that you can think about. You can think about legal stuff, you can think about business structure, you can think about business model, you can think about I your logo, your business name, your, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But I think what you're sort of um, taking on responsibility for doing is uh, is shaking the snow globe of us all vigorously and saying, just get up and sell. Yeah. That's what you're trying to tell us, isn't it? <laughs> just get on and sell. I love that. So I've got another spaghetti question for you, Alan. Yes, and I, I just want to apologise to anyone listening if I offended you. I didn't mean to. Like, everyone is unique. I love you all. We're all special. We're all different. And there are so many commonalities in business that sometimes we get so caught up in the differences that we forget to see the similarities and take the simple actions. Nice. So what about your development as a coach? Because, you know, since we ran the first Rebel School course in 2012, (laughs) uh, we've had the privilege of people asking us lots of questions over the years and it's refined our ability to be able to help people and so on. But I wondered if there's any new lessons that you'd learned in your ability to help people through through doing the deeper dive coaching episodes over a period of time. I think that the biggest lesson or reflection that I've had over the last two years of doing the coaching series There's an expression I repeat on the podcast ad finitum, which is the extraordinary belongs to those that create it. And it sounds amazing, and it's true, but I think there's two bits that get get lost in that sentence. And the first bit is, people think extraordinary has to be something big and incredible, and it doesn't. Extraordinary is whatever your version is. I don't care like one lady said to me I don't want to be extraordinary I just want to have dinner with my family around a new dining room table every night and I remember saying that's extraordinary who has dinner with their family around a nice table every night who does that so that's your version of extraordinary make it happen so I think people get confused about that part and the second bit because the word is extraordinary is in there I think they think they need to do something extraordinary. But actually, the extraordinary is built 
from the mundane daily repetitious activities that we all need to put in to get to where we want to get to. And two random examples, financial independence, extraordinary. Never have to work again, you've got enough money. How is it created? Like daily tracking of spending. Yeah. <laughs> uh, daily strength not to buy the Starbucks coffee or the whatever it is. Like the daily small actions that create an extraordinary life. A business, a business is built by doing daily sales calls, daily marketing, the action to improve your stuff, self-development, the small things. And extraordinary is rooted in the mundane, Simon. I love that. It makes me think of, you know, <clears throat> over the years, the gazillions of business ideas that, that you and I have come up with and <laughs> some have been left on the cutting room floor, some of them have been executed or partially executed and so on. Quite a few of them other people have done before we've got round to it. Yeah, for sure. One of those was very frustrated about, it's like, oh, we found it two years after we discussed it. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and I think, you know, anyone can do that but the real magic is in showing up even in some small way every day, isn't it? Every single day. Yeah. Every and I, single I think that's day. the thing about extraordinary because extraordinary actually changes over time. And I think that's what the genius is of the, of the mini experiment way of thinking because, you know, lots of people are paralyzed when they go, I've got this giant dream and I want this and I want that. But actually, you know, extraordinary is, making a couple of hundred pounds every month or a couple of hundred dollars in the first couple of months and taking steps towards extraordinary because then yes. that becomes you know then the dream changes doesn't it yeah i mean i know that you didn't dream of being on a colombian thinker 12 <laughs> years ago <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we were having these conversations. I just wanted to sell a course and help people start businesses. That yeah. was it. That was my one mission was to sell something and help people start businesses. That was it. And I think that possibilities reveal themselves the more action that you take. Mm. Like the, uh, the geeky Harvard professors would call that emergent strategy, which is where you start and then along the way the universe presents things you weren't expecting and goes why didn't you try this or go over here or do that then you've got a decision how much do you stick to the business plan you had in your mind versus how much do you just try something else and head off in a different direction so wait a minute you're telling me that making things up as you go along has got a posh name uh, everything has a posh name if you go into academia. Making things up as you go along with purpose. Emergent strategy. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Good, I've learned something uh, today. Thank you, Alan. I've been reading a new book about, yeah, I, you know I love to read. I love new books. Alan's got a new, new book, ideas. everyone. Look um, out. Yeah, look out. Things are going to happen. Um, so, look, I've got a couple more questions for you, Al. Okay, I love that. Um, I'm interested to know who you want to coach next. Oh. Is there a kind of business? Is there a kind of individual? Is there a challenge? Is there uncharted coaching territory, Alan? Oh, I've never even thought of that question. This is this is why this is good, because you ask questions I don't even think about. Um, Stop padding for time. Get on with it. <laughs> so I've just started a brand new coaching series about confidence, uh, which is actually one of the Rebel Business School team members. And... We've never really properly dived into confidence, but I think it is the magic ingredient that makes the difference. If you wake up confident, the day is yours, the world is yours. If you wake up nervous, you're just gonna put yourself through torture for the day, torturing yourself that you should be doing this, but you don't feel like it. So I think that I'm very excited about. It's one, no one's gonna believe me when I say this. I was the most timid, shy kid you could imagine. Couldn't talk to strangers, couldn't do anything. And I had to learn confidence. I had to create confidence. So it's one I've conquered for myself. It's one I've helped other people to do to a small extent, but it's like a two hour session in our workshop, isn't it? It's not a, let's go deep and build unlimited confidence. So I'm very excited about that one. Oh, then it brings me into, if anyone's got a Lego business and wants coaching, I'm well <laughs> up for that. Uh, 
if anyone wants to produce a movie and wants coaching, I'm well up for that. I've never done it, but I'd love to coach you from a business perspective. I don't know, like, I'd love to get into some different pieces, some different industries. And I think the more we do this and the more different industries we go into, the more we'll see the similarities and the differences. So if one of your listeners is uh, of, you know, is sat there now thinking, do you know what? I think I would really love to be coached by Alan. <laughs> it doesn't think sound carefully. that terrifying. Uh, I'm up for it, and I think that could have a massive impact on my life and my business and so on. What advice would you give them about the process of coaching with you? Well, How think... should they prepare, and what should they, um, you know, what should they know and do? Uh... That's an interesting one, isn't it? Because most of the time you just dive in from the start and I start asking questions. Um, The standard questions I'm always going to ask at the start are what are you selling and who are you selling it to? So that's going to be the basis of where we start every time is the clarity around what are you selling and who are you selling to and then how do you get it to them and then breaking that down. I think a lot of the times I assume people's product is good, assume people's product or service are good and I should probably dive a bit more into customer feedback and quality as well, Um, but it's incredible, nearly, I would have said 90% of people's issues is getting more customers rather than anything else, which comes down to figuring out the business model at the start. Uh, I think... You know what scares people most about working with me, Simon, I think, and you can tell me whether this is true, is if they tell me a dream, I will work to make it come true. So then it's a bit nerve wracking because sometimes people like to have the dream. They're not actually sure if they want the real thing. And then I force them to do it. I think lots of people are scared of success, for sure. That really resonates. I've heard that many times through people that come through our courses who are actually giving me the tools to make this real. I've never been in that position before. That means I actually have to do this. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, which can get uncomfortable. But then we're back to your success in life is directly related to the amount of uncomfortable moments you can sit through. So, Alan, I know, like, I've known you many years. One of the things that you're really awesome at is is a close. And, I, you know, I just wanted to one uh, to suggest that, to wrap up this episode, what message do you want to give people about coaching, about making progress, about creating an extraordinary life? Thank you, Simon. I think that, number one you've got to decide what your version of extraordinary is and that's actually quite difficult because society tells us what extraordinary is and extraordinary is a four bed house a stable job two kids a labrador and a fancy car bought on debt there's success but not many people actually take the time to decide what extraordinary means for them so i would love you if you're listening to this now is decide what is an extraordinary life to me. And then we can step about breaking it down, working out how to do it, what's the first steps, taking action. I would say the second message is the one we sort of picked up at the start, which is probably the thing you need to do is the thing you're most scared of which I know is annoying. I find it super annoying because Simon asks me a question, goes, what do you really need to do? And I go, oh, it's that thing I don't want to do. I'm convinced that the universe or God has a sense of humour, Alan. <laughs> I'm not sure they have a sense of humour. They're just sent here to torture us. <laughs> no, my perspective on that is that tough thing, you don't want to do it because you haven't let, yet learnt the lesson that you need to learn from it. So you don't want to do it because it's scary, because it's whatever, but it's actually the thing you need to do, and it might go wrong. But in going wrong, it will teach you the lesson you need to get to the next level. And it's super annoying, isn't it? It's just, it's what we have to do. We have to do the thing we don't want to do to get to the next level, have the tough conversation, make the sales call. My experience of that recently is that 
the the thing that you're most scared of sometimes does play out to be a very scary thing and you were right to be scared of it but that's okay you'll be all right and then the second thing that sometimes plays out is the thing that you thought would be the most terrifying thing was actually the easiest thing once you got on and did it and it was something that you hadn't even thought of that turned out to be much scarier it, but also you can handle that you know we are built to handle scary we are at the the tip of the evolutionary arrow alan we've been dealing with scary for thousands and thousands of years we've survived wars and pandemics and mosquito filled walks in colombian thinkers and mostly nowadays uh modern day scary is being awkwardly embarrassed and like if that's the worst that can happen to you you're not going to die Bring it on. putting your first video on YouTube. I guarantee that, unless I guess you cross the wires and electrocute yourself doing something. But, but you're not going to die doing that. You're not going to die making the sales call. Scare, there are levels of scary. Um, so we just need to tackle that thing. And I know this is probably what you don't want to hear. But you're going to be okay. Just do the tough thing and let's have a go and let's learn. And you will be so much stronger for having done it. I'm sure there's a number three, Alan. Just, just whilst uh, you think of number three, the uh, if anyone wants the evidence that the very first YouTube video <laughs> can be dreadful and it's okay, no harm will come from it, please find your way to the Rebel School YouTube channel and look for the video of Alan and I sat on a cr on your cream leather sofa, which I'm convinced was um, was lopsided. It where was. We it had fallen to pieces. We it sat next to each other and couch. recorded the worst video I've ever recorded in my life, because that was the first one. With the dishwasher open behind me, I hadn't learned to look at your surroundings when creating a YouTube video. <laughs> but nothing stage. bad happened. No. All that happened is that we created a business that launched in seven countries and helped 15,000 people. Yes. All starts with the first video, doesn't it? It all starts with the first video. The first post, the you first email, the first sale. You cannot get version two without version one. So was there a third thing on your mind, Alan? Yeah, so, like, number one, decide what extraordinary means to you. Number two, take the action that you think, like, the thing that is you don't want to do. That's probably the thing you've got to tackle. And then number three is the realisation that extraordinary is built in the mundane moments every day like we are literally walking up and down a coffee plantation which is incredible but we are pacing up and down <laughs> creating a podcast being eaten by mosquitoes it's cool and it's just something you do and if you're launching a youtube channel you need to produce a video every month every week every other day if you're launching a photography business you need to make five sales calls a day and learn how to sell if you're launching a comic book Kickstarter, or maybe a coffee Kickstarter in the future, you need to message people every day and ask them to buy and connect with them. And it's those daily mundane activities that will create the life of your dreams. I love that, Alan. So, um, the extraordinary belongs to those who create it. Shall we get on with it? <laughs> Thank you for listening to The Rebel Entrepreneur with my Susio Socio Simon. We are off to drink coffee in Colombia and work on our version of Extraordinary. You can have any life you want to. Choose to build something cool. Choose to take action. Choose to work to make your dreams become reality. Stand out. Be different. Be yourself. Be a rebel entrepreneur.